Welcome to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. In today's episode, we have short stories from Peter Waits and Heidi Bank, and a poem by Paul Camerata. Hello, I'm Peter Waits, and this is I Figured It Out, as read by me. When we lived in Hull, Massachusetts, during the summer we would go to see plays at the South Shore Music Circus in Cohasset. Summerstock Theater in the Round was a treat to enjoy on a balmy evening. And one of the wonderful plays we saw there was The Pajama Game. One of the memorable songs from that play was I Figured It Out. I figured it out that dealt with a potential pay raise of seven and a half cents an hour and how that would lead to an annual salary increase of $156. Frugal me, I've done a little better than an increase of $156 a year. Actually, I'm not talking about an increase in dollars earned, but an increase in savings and the potential wealth and my better health. A long time ago, I learned that the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is 10 days. About 30 years ago, I stopped going to the barbershop for a haircut. I was bald. And when every two weeks I'd go to the barbershop, the barber would always ask me how I wanted my hair styled. Like there were a lot of choices. I'd grunt, just cut it. And then he'd grab a clipper and trim the few hairs on my head. A few minutes later, I'd give him 10 bucks for the haircut and $5 for the tip. One day I was in Kmart. And I saw I could buy a hair clipper for $10, and I bought one. I started giving myself haircuts. Am I as good as what I got back then? No, but who cares? If it's a bad one in 10 days, it'll be good. So I don't care. You know who cares. She tells me my handiwork on my head doesn't look good, but I can't see what she sees, so I'm okay with what I do. And what I do is... For the last 30 years, I have given myself a haircut whenever I wanted one. Using simple math, which sadly is no longer taught properly, over that time, this is what I would have spent had I continued going to the barbershop every two weeks. Let me see, 26 haircuts a year, times $15 a haircut, times 30 years, equals $11,700. To compute my savings on haircuts, I have to factor in the cost of the $10 clipper, resulting in a net savings of the not-too-shabby $11,690. But wait, wait, I'm not done saving money. Here comes more good news. The clipper comes with a variety of trimming doodads, and I use one of them to trim my beard. In other words, I don't shave. And I haven't shaved for about 20 years. No shave means I have no need for razor blades. And I have no need for shaving cream. So I haven't bought either one. The last time I looked, the blades looked to be very expensive. On a conservative basis, I got to figure not buying blades and not buying shaving cream is another savings of about another $10,000. Bringing my total savings to $21,690. And now, and now for the really, really big savings, I stopped smoking almost 32 years ago, in May 1985. I can remember the exact day I stopped because, coincidentally, it was on May 13th when the then mayor of Philadelphia, Mayor Good, authorized the bombing of the home of a radical group called MOVE. And the bombing was responsible for burning down an entire block of homes. Every year, the Philadelphia newspapers retell the story, and that reminds me that that is the day I quit smoking. Until I quit, I was a -a two-pack-a-day smoker. And I figure over time, on average, that smoking habit cost me about $12 a day. In other words, I haven't had a cigarette in about 11,680 days for an approximate savings of another $140,160. And... And this is important. If I had continued smoking, I would have smoked about 467,200 cigarettes from then until now. Putting this together, in addition to the obvious health benefit, over the years, I figure I have saved a rather tidy sum, about $161,850. The question then is, what the hell did I do with that savings? And the answer is, I have no proof, just an idea. 
On a daily basis, unlike Silas Marner, I certainly didn't stuff the savings under our mattress so I could count it. No, the money stayed in that checking account so we could both use it as we wished. And I know it was used because it isn't there. I know this is going to sound tough, but there was only one possible explanation to where all this money went, and it is not what I did with it, because, as I mentioned, I am frugal. I inherited the frugal gene from my mother. I don't spend anything on myself. Ergo, with only two possible culprits in our house, it is easy to figure it out. If it ain't me that spent all that money, and I'm telling you it ain't me, then it's got to be you-know-who. What did she do with it? I don't know. Truth be told, you know who spent my savings of $161,850. I could send her a bill, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want to sound too repetitious, so all I would say is, I figured it out, and being with you know who, I know I got my money's worth. Hi, I'm Heidi Bank, and this is a story called 40, as read by me. The October I turned 27, I was unemployed, having been laid off the previous July from the worst job I ever had. I was worried about the future of my career, but overjoyed to be free from the worst job ever and able to enjoy my favorite month of the year. It was a frugal time, living off savings and unemployment checks while I was job hunting, but it was also the season of pumpkin everything, the most wonderful time of the year. So my modest birthday celebration consisted of a visit to Dunkin' Donuts for a pumpkin coffee and pumpkin donut. I chose the Dunkin' at the corporate park nearest my parents' house, where I had stopped earlier to say hello, as one who is jobless is apt to do midday. I drove my white Toyota Corolla with the windows down and the crisp autumn breeze blowing and wore my favorite lightweight corduroy jacket, which I owned for the next decade until I literally wore holes in it and sadly had to let it go. The coffee was spicy sweet and tasted so good. It was a good day. I am four days away from turning 40. Dunkin' is no longer an option due to my healthy diet, which renders donuts poison and makes pumpkin-flavored coffee taste like chemicals. I now express my enduring love of everything pumpkin via pumpkin spice-scented candles and elaborate displays of actual real-life pumpkins. I've been employed at the same place for the last 12 years. I'd get this job seven months after my birthday at Dunkin' Donuts, just as I was beginning to consider maybe trying something else, since clearly this career in TV production wasn't working out. I was not freaked out at the prospect of turning 40 literally up until this week. I'd look at the number bemused, remembering when I was a kid and thought my 40-something parents were super old, realizing my 7-year-old probably looks at me now and thinks the same thing. 40 seemed an abstract number only peripherally related to me. I don't look 40. I don't feel 40. I don't act 40. What is 40 anyway? Then suddenly today I find myself pondering my life, questioning my choices, questioning my success, questioning marriage and friendships, questioning depression, which comes and goes like an unwelcome acquaintance questioning the work paradigm, if perhaps there isn't a better way than giving a job 40 hours a week, questioning how I want my life to turn out, realizing truly for the first time that my life will eventually have an end. Tonight after work, I went to the mall, which, shockingly to my tween self, I really don't enjoy anymore. I got a raise last week, so I treated myself to a shiny apple red pair of Hunter rain boots. Slightly more expensive than that cup of pumpkin coffee 13 years ago, but I'm not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. I love red shoes. They kick ass. These will kick ass in the rain. There's been a lot of rain lately. Hi, I'm Paul Camerata, and this is The Decline and Rise of Frank K. Tork, as read by me. Frank K. Tork's neck was bent on account of all the years he'd spent hauling cement. And his joints were stiff, his spine was curved, the hot and cold wires were reversed in his nerves. Yo, brah, to his pal said Frank, this body of mine's like a broke piggy bank. Yo, once upon a time, it was full and strong, brah. But lately, is it like that? 
I gotta say, nah. Frank's interest wasn't to be old and frail. He yearned for his old vigor, more wind in his sail. He tried rest and running, swimming and weights. Yo, brah, Frank thought. Working good. This ain't. Let me hit the Googles, brah. Find some new intel to limber these legs and drain my swell. Frank pecked and hunted for what he didn't know. And then he saw it and whispered to himself, Yo, brah, this may be it. How to breathe and stretch. How to undo feeling like a rusted plumber's wrench. Frank mimicked the moves, read all the pages, and his pain rolled away in slow, steady stages. Until reborn was Frank K. Tork. So much he felt compelled to be a pain relief stork, delivering to others bridge and plank tips, how to exhale stress and loosen their hips. From his cement pouring, Frank soon resigned to begin a new career of his own design. That's how Yobra Yoga first got started. The studio where healing Frank K. Tork imparted on the brawniest barrel-chested bra yoga doubters whose bodies ache so bad they'd come to him as powders, ready, willing, and able to try anything to return their step its long-ago gone spring. I've been there, bra, absolutely for reals, said Frank K. Tork. I know what you feels. Yo, bra yoga, it won't disappoint. If it did, I'd have never could have built this joint. So try it and see. No more delaying, said Frank K. Tork. I'm not saying... I'm just saying. Thanks for joining us. For more information about the podcast and the authors, visit asreadbyme.com. If you're a writer and would like to read one of your stories on an upcoming episode, send an email to writers at asreadbyme.com. If you like what we're doing and would like to help us remain ad-free, you can support us by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash asreadbyme. See you next time.